Right down in the jungle room this morning. We're gonna get out with Bruce and see about some trees. Cheers. I'm feeling the vibes that be got me high and moving. The subtle embrace, the touch of the base that's building. The jungle room that I often come in to get some food and meet people is actually at the bit the back of Big Plant and Bruce runs Big Plant. My love is for hard exotic plants. Architectural, hard exotic, evergreens. See you Thanks, Virgil. See you later, Virgil. See you, mate. It's really simple. Uh, my heart is in a rainforest and so when winter arrives and you see that, I kind of feel a bit sad. I need green yeah. and evergreens and just having a few architectural plants, evergreens mm. in the garden, mm. lifts my spirits in the winter, yeah. you know, it gives me a bit of a buzz. But we're yeah. going to go and see what you've done in your own place. Yeah, yeah, so let's go and have a look. This is where I lose track of time I'm spinning. Away, away, away. Look at those bad boys. Away. Is that a vine as well? That looks like it could be grapes. Do you think that's grapes? <laughs> we are back in the rainforest. Welcome back to Corcovado, everybody. About 12 years ago, this was just a field. 12 years ago, yeah, this... No, no trees. Whole nothing. place was just a field. It, it was just grass. Okay. I used to rent a cottage just over the hill there. And then this bit of land came up for sale, and I bought it up. Then we started the journey, planning application, put those two tunnels up, and then I built the other half years later. I can't help it. Can I touch them? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and look at those ones as well. They're all green. Oh, you've got to get in there and... Wow. Look at They're this. so strong. They're so solid. Bamboo is one of the strongest building materials on the planet. More people live in bamboo houses than they do any other type of house. What? Mm, Where? Um, all over the world. If you bend it, the lateral compressibility yeah. is similar to carbon fiber. Wow. So it's like super strong. Wow. It's pliable. It's hardy. That fills my heart with joy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on a winter's day. But not only that, it's packed full of wildlife. Because in the winter, all the birds roost in here. Can I get in amongst it? Yeah, yeah. It's huge. That is gargantuan. How long does it take to grow these shoots? Because this is what, uh, 30 feet high? A shoot like that grows yeah. in three months. What do you mean, that height, that much? From zero yeah. to 30 feet in three months. No, it doesn't. Yes, it no, does. it doesn't. I kid you not. From here, yeah. follow my finger all the way up to there in three months. Yeah. But it only does three months of growth in a year. Exactly. It's doing a lot of growth for the rest of the year underground. A bit like an old-fashioned car aerial. It's forming, and when the temperature gets good enough and the moisture levels are just right, it pumps full of water and just goes over a 24-hour period, got 53 centimetres of growth in 24 hmm. hours. That's, that is ridiculous. Yeah. This is such a good metaphor for life because basically we can't judge the book by its cover. You know, growth isn't linear. It may be linear in reality, but our perception of it is completely non-linear. So we might think this bamboo shoot was doing nothing for nine months, which it apparently was, but in reality, it was just waiting for its final catalyst to then just do that. These fellas are absolutely packed full of nutrition and you can eat them. No, you can't. You have already eaten them. When you have a Chinese meal and you have bamboo shoots, Okay. bamboo shoots are these. I said it looked a bit like a courgette, which is what got us onto this. It looks like the longest <laughs> courgette in the world. But bamboo shoots, the phyllus, Phyllostachys. So this controls the level of water in the field and wow. takes the excess out to the ditch in the road. Is it as simple as if you dig a ditch yeah. in a wet field, water will run into it? It is if you live in this part of Sussex around Wheelstone Clay. We've got a very, quite a shallow uh, topsoil uh, and then a, a significant depth of clay. Yeah. It's brick making clay. Particularly if you dig it with a digger, yeah. you smear the sides of it. You can see we've built a large pond, no liner. How long does it take to dig out a pool? A day. A day? Yeah. <sighs> Sounds like something I should be thinking about. We've got microclimates everywhere all over England, so it's not particularly special to Sussex. But where we are lucky in the UK is that our climate's pretty temperate. There's a lot of middle ground. Just by planting it slightly raised so that its feet aren't in water, you know, you can create a habitat that makes it happy. Super wet, super dry. It's easy to make generalizations, but this is six feet apart. It's not rocket science. No. You think about it. No, but you have to look closely though, don't you? Yeah. And pay attention to each spot. I would be tempted to say, oh, in South America, trees grow like this. Yeah. And you can't even say that, or Costa Rica, or even one part of Costa Rica. It's like you've got to get right <laughs> down is. to the hyperlocal. It is. It's just all about microclimates. Just keep on floating till I'm in the clouds of all peace. They weren't 
it rains, all the water that falls on top of the tunnel goes into here. Wow! And then I pump it back into the tunnel to water the plants. You put 20 years into a garden that you rented? Yeah. How did you feel about that? I, I didn't really have any problems with it. You know, I, I wasn't just planting it for me, I was planting it for the environment. But was there not a sadness moving from that mature place back to a field, which is what this was to begin with? Well, yeah, but there's a sadness of leaving something, but there's also the excitement of creating something. Professionally, what I do is create gardens for people. Every garden that I've created in my working life, which is over 30 years, you leave a little bit of you in the garden yeah. you've created. It wasn't really any different. Okay. That, just a, a longer extension of it. Just keep on. We've got breeding here at least eight different types of damsel and dragonflies, which previously wouldn't wouldn't have been here, and they've just obviously flown over, identified the site, came in. And that's doing nothing more clever than allowing water to collect. When I'm listening to this, the whole time I'm thinking about what we're doing with putting huts in places. I sort of it automatically transpose it to a human level and think, yeah, humans will do their human thing and they will give birth and they will die and they will do that stuff but actually if you create little pockets specific environments that we might see different kinds of forms of creativity coming out if we can create the human version of like pockets of water the water was already all here the field was already all here but if you congregate it and and sort of create a different kind of space with it maybe a different result comes out because i'm never coming back down because of the clay soil, you literally just use the digger and sort of smeared the sides to make it sort of almost water tight itch, and then it just filled with water naturally. And then all these, you say rushes? These are rushes, yeah. They're all just come up naturally since we puddled the water. Yeah, this is just dormant seed that was here in the field. So it was here, but it needed puddled water to, to grow in. The learnings just keep coming to me thick and fast. So the bamboo's teaching us that growth can be happening that we can't see and it can accelerate <laughs> beyond all normal expectations. And then this is showing me that there may be all sorts of dormant seeds in something that we would perceive as derelict or dead or useless, but it maybe doesn't just have the right basic conditions to grow in. And if you enhance the situation, you might find all sorts of craziness coming out. Every night I come down here and I just spend 20 minutes, half an hour, I just chill. You won't really be able to see them guys, but there's some buzzards chomping around in the sky, which are, I'm told, the apex predators. Okay, so I'm gonna think this through in real time. Apex predators are the first ones to go if an ecology at the grassroots level is being devoured or is, is, is dying, you'll know because the apex predators disappear, right? Is that what you're, that what you're saying? Totally. If that's the case, we might think, oh, we need to make a, an intervention at the apex predator level, at the top of the food chain. But actually, it might be something as grassroots as needing to enhance or change the way the water is being collected at the grassroots level in order to create the diversity that filters up the chain to get you something like an apex predator. 20 years ago, these birds weren't here. Really? And the reason these are here is because of the change in farming methods. There's better countryside stewardship of the hedgerows and there's more diversity in our landscape. By allowing nature to recover from our farming, intensive farming methods. It heals. If you take action, you can turn things back around. Yeah. And you can bring nature back. If someone's got like a little garden, they live in a city or a town or whatever, and they have a little garden somewhere, mm -hmm. what could they do in a few meters of space? Yeah, it's massive because they have the potential to create the biggest nature reserve in the UK, linking together. If you've only got two square meters and you just let nature run its course, have a couple of bits of bramble, but don't let it take it over. It maybe leave some bits of um, logs and stuff like that on the ground. If you can kind of protect the space that you have, even if it's a couple of meters, yeah. from one thing overpowering everything, yeah. and if you don't farm or create one thing, mm. you just let a few different things happen on different scales, you know, yeah. some things that are brand new that will come quickly and go, and some things that stay there for a long time. Yeah that that might create a bit of a mini ecosystem. Very much. And then that will connect to the next spot in the next garden, the next garden. Did it. Just yeah. think how big it would be. Even people that live in like, inner cities that think, you know, I can't do a window box. Put a window box, just buy a packet of wildflower mix, put it in it, and you would have invertebrates in there within months. You have heard a very practical voice of hope 
that we can actually do our bit to increase the diversity at the grassroots level of ecology. We're not alone. You do your bit, everybody does their bit. That is, all adds to it. So if you say you can do nothing, find an old box, find an old crate, whatever it is, make a window box, get a bit of soil, put some wildflower mix in there and you'll be doing something. Whether people have big landowners or tiny landowners, it's all the same. If you're not doing it right on a small scale, you won't be doing anything on a big scale either. California, Chile, Scots Pine, Himalayas, Himalayas, uh, Japan, Japan. <laughs> God, and do they all like get on all right together? Yeah, they all sort of grow as one sort of big community. But if we were to cut off this whole trunk here, push it into the ground, yeah, now, it would start growing. It'd just start growing. Yeah. yeah, that's like saying if you chopped off my arm and stuck it in the ground, <laughs> you'd get a whole new human. But look at the size of these fellas. They're, they're, <laughs> these trees are, are only kind of like 15 years old. 15 years old? Yeah. That is an absolute beast. Maybe I'd I like could plant some... a couple of those branches. I, yeah, if you want some. Yeah, you can, you can I think it'd be them. fun. Well, like we know you were talking about the chapel. Yeah. I was thinking maybe even you could use this as the, the, um, the spire. That would be an amazing spire. <laughs> it would work, wouldn't it? <laughs> so the idea that we've been mulling around, and I guess it's gained a bit of momentum since I've been well, talking with Bruce and, and others that know the land. What if we could make some kind of living chapel? The thing I found weird since being in the woods is going back to all these buildings, whether offices or homes or, or places of worship, that are all dead, essentially. The materials are all been chopped off or been manufactured and are dead. But for me, what's so inspiring about being in the woods is that it's all very much alive and all very much living and connected. And for me, it creates the right kind of thought and, and experience, the most wisdom, I guess. And so for me, it makes perfect sense to have a place of stillness and silence and being that is actually living. If we were going down the, the chapel route then, what do you think would be good as the four corners? Or, or would you even do it that way? Would you do it a different way? I would give yourself a very rough framework with timber uh, and then fill it in with living willow. So you just get your rough structure, yeah. because then you could help tie the willow into the structure. Cut these branches, yeah. these big ones, and use these as your structures. They'll actually start growing gain as well. Without a root system? Yeah, well, they'll make a new root system. Really? Yeah. <laughs> How deep would you need to go in the ground, do you reckon? We need to get them in at least 60 centimetres. That's not bad. No, the deeper we do it, the better, but 60 okay. centimetres. You don't need foundations, you don't need to go to too much depth, because the whole structure will tie itself together <laughs> it will kind of be it'll almost be sprung it'll survive a hurricane yeah because it's just gonna it's gonna handle it all <laughs> it's so much better it's so much better at building than we are yeah yeah so this is the kind of thing that i would love to actually get good at i would love to actually figure out how this works because this is not something i've heard about before other than a couple of images on google so i'm very excited to learn more about this we managed to get a date in the diary for a couple of weeks time where we'll try and come and cut down some of this willow and stick it in a trailer, get it back up to the cottage and then think about where to plant it. But it's, it's not too, too tricky because the root system will take very easily at this time of year. That's the point. If we wait too much longer, Bruce says the leaves will start coming through and it won't take. So now is the time. So on the 24th, we're going to try and give it a go. Before I forget, I'm going to put Big Plant's Facebook in below. All right, back at Brenda's and we're going to have a little scout to see if this spot for a sort of living chapel idea. So we've been looking at all the different fields, the trees and the fields all around it, because I'm still figuring out which bit we're going to use. And as you know, we want to try and do something with this pig shed here, maybe make a bit of a garden there. So I was kind of thinking that up to maybe where the pylon is, we could just have like social sort of space where we try and cultivate a volleyball court. Yes. Part of what could make having a space like this really special is, is its placement and it, its centricity, if you will. The nice thing about this small field is that it's not very commercially valuable because you can't put too many animals on it, um, but it is nicely framed and it has its own access and it's not, it's next to the house but it's not dependent on the house. So if we planted the willows in here, 
then and then a wild orchard around it and maybe some of the more exotic things like within that little spot where you've got all the continents represented yeah. and then right around the edge we'd have sort of leave access and if I needed to I could put huts in each corner instead of spreading them around in the in the trees or in other fields then this is kind of could be a self-contained kind of space that works with a social space a garden a sense of simple being a place to sort of get back in touch with creation really it's already got its own microclimate feel to it hasn't it you're going to have the the cold running away from it you've got all the hedges around it so that it's probably a degree or two warmer than than one of the larger fields oh really if we put willows in here do you think it would dry out the land a bit like yeah, suck it, up some of the water it will certainly dry out the land um it will help improve the land as well okay that's good be a good idea to roll it as well and that old picture it's gorgeous isn't it <laughs> yeah it'll be great can imagine that all sort of lit up with um, some nice rugs in there and things it's like moroccan -y kind of look bruce is a legend i've learned so much today and i feel i hope you guys feel it too i feel very inspired and hopeful sometimes the environment can feel like something way out of control that there's nothing we can do anything about but the way he breaks it down makes me feel very excited about what someone in sussex can do with a plant pot or a window box or whatever. We've got the time for dinner. The bad boys are coming up even through the patio. I just got my first bit of post. If you guys want to send anything to Brenda's cottage, please do it here. And these guys have been kind enough. Wow. Oh. Wow. That is absolutely stunning dave best wishes from mark rose p.s if in doubt of what it is have another look at the website i will have another look at the website but it looks like it's going to go very well on brenda's table i think it's going to be some kind of i don't know it looks like a cutting board to me sorry if i've got that wrong but why don't you guys check out the website too and we can both find out what it is and if you guys want to send anything in then please go for it if you want to write any letters Actually, that's a good point. If you guys write letters and you want them, kind of half stealing this idea from Tim Lovejoy, who has a podcast called Dear Lovejoy, who should be coming here at some point. But if you guys write letters and you want them read out as part of the podcast, then that could be a way to get your voice shared from different countries around the world if you didn't want to call in. So you can call in, you can Skype in, or you can write a letter. The thing I like about a letter more than email is that you really have to put yourself out to write the letter and so i really trust that you really care about and mean what you're saying so yeah do that that'd be very exciting right it's all coming together nicely Woo! i can't tell you how different i feel compared to a couple of weeks ago once again take care of yourselves guys look after each other i'll see you next thursday 9 p.m